<laughs> Hello, you're on the air. Tony, how, how are you? I'm really good. How are you? I'm feeling great. I just wanted to give you a quick health tip and add on to Weatherman's uh, choices. Are you familiar with yellowtail root? Yellowtail root? I'm not familiar with it. Do you smoke it? You soak no, it in tea? No, um, it, it grows in the beginning of the spring, and you can gather it and boil it up, and it's really amazing for the immune system. You uh, just inject it as an enema, and uh, you do that once, I say twice a week, and oh, I've no. been doing it most of my life. And I, I yeah, tell I you, it's there. totally amazing. I hear the kids are developing measles and the mumps now. And, you know, I, I, my little nephews and everyone, I have them using it because no. I feel that holistic healing is always going to be much better <laughs> than the actual medications and all these Obamacare's and doctors because <laughs> they're not actually licensed to really give you accurate information. We gotta lower the volume on you. Uh, Listen, I love you, thanks for calling, but you know, New Yorkers, they, they, they this, uh, What is that, Tony? I'm just saying, I, I can't imagine you giving enemas to all your nephews and nieces, so we're gonna let you oh, go, no, all right? No, I'm gonna no, stop me, there. Not, not me personally. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for calling, though. What do you think about Reverend Al, a rat or a cat? Okay, ladies uh, and gentlemen, I haven't even right. told you the story yet. We're halfway through the show. Sharpton secretly worked as a mob FBI informant, Lorraine. Meet Al Sharpton, confidential informant number seven. The longtime agitator, civil rights activist, and TV host was exposed two days ago in an alleged, as an alleged former key FBI informant whose tips helped take down some of the biggest names in the New York Mafia history. Oh, no. Yeah. Now he's in trouble. Oh, he is in trouble, yes. Reverend Al, or we're calling him, you call us, ladies and gentlemen, you tell us, Reverend Cat or Reverend Rat. We have the video there to play that. If you guys, if we have the time, we'll play that. If you guys can find it in the, in the production suite there, we'll play the... the Wait, how did it get out that he was just informant? I thought it was supposed to be... Oh, we're going to play it. Secret. It will play it. You guys tell us. Go ahead, play it, Lorraine. You listen to him here. Nothing new about this story. Joe Banner was the one that set up the meeting with this guy, Sal. So, I've done a lot of things in life. Some that if I could do again, I would do differently. But in this situation, I did what was right. Okay, caller, you're on there. Can I we hear the caller? You can kind of lower out a little bit. Everyone's yeah. heard this. Of a How, you, to do. How you doing, Tony? And I did what Hello. I kids What's going on over there? there? Oh, man, we're oh, hanging in. We're listening to Reverend Cat Reverend or they Reverend they Rat. Well, I want to. I think he's getting guns. Speak up, keep going. I think he should be called Reverend Fat. Reverend Fat. <laughs> but he's not fat no more. Well, that was back then. He was a fat ass. And, and, and he was selling cocaine. Did you know that, Tony? No, man, I didn't know that. He was selling cocaine. Yeah. He, he, he used to sell cocaine, and then when he got caught, he, he said he would be a snitch and turn into Genevieve. Got it, I see. Yeah, he got caught by the FBI selling cocaine in 1981 in a cowboy hat in Harlem. Him and Wango. You know Wango? Yeah. Yeah, they were all sniffing cocaine, hanging out in Harlem Lounge, stealing money. They were, they were the wild politicians. Cowboy crew. Holy cow. Yeah. I know he used to, he used to have a gun and everything. Al Sharpton. Yeah. Holy cow. Yeah, Al Sharpton is a bad boy, man. All right, well, I know that now. Hey, um, how come you know all this? Well, the thing is, is that, you know, I'm a real New Yorker. So let's leave it at that. All right. Are you in the mob, too? Well, you know, I'm 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 a guy that's all around a lot of things. Let's leave it at that. Okay. Well, listen, my friend, we thank you for calling our show. Okay. Yeah. All right. You take care, Tony. Peace, man. Thanks for calling. You're okay. the best. You're on the air. Yes. Uh, I have a story about Al Sharpton. He when I used to live on 127th and Saint Nicholas and Seventh Avenue up that way. Holy cow! He, he used to. Uh, have sex with a friend of mine's mother, and he would Ooh. come over, and they would have wild, I heard the man talking about cocaine earlier, they would have wild cocaine parties, 
And O.J. Simpson used to bring the best cocaine. He was known for having the best coke. And Al Sharpton and O.J. and everybody, they would all hang out. And my friend's mother used to hang out with them. And, and her and uh, Sharpton, they used to bang each other. And she was married, but she was addicted to cocaine and that lived in the high life and with the Rolls Royces and limos, because he was a high roller, that Al Sharpton. He's low profile now. But I, I've known since the past he's been uh, putting his uh, penis up the ass in New York City. He's really been working us, him and that wrangle. Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, we have a topic, okay? And the topic is um, about UFOs, all right? And UFOs over Brooklyn. There's been a lot of UFOs over Brooklyn spotted. We'll play some of the videos in the background there. But we've got a gentleman here by the name of Chad Meek. And uh, Chad is going to talk to us a little bit about the uh, history of UFOs because... Um, he has a movie coming out. It's called GiantRockTheMovie.com. You can go check that out, check out the trailer. And, you know, there's a whole sort of a beginning of the UFO society and the people who sort of started that and looked at it, etc. Yeah, you can just take all the volume off those completely, yeah. Or just mute the button, yeah. So, Chad, I want to say hello to you. Give a volume test right there. How are you doing, sir? Fantastic, Tony. Happy blood moon to you. Look out the window. That's a blood moon. All right. So, uh, you know, it's I, full. It's perfect. <laughs> OK. <laughs> you know, I'm so interested in you because I, I looked a lot on the site and I read uh, uh, as much as I could about the the the, you know, the interest in the UFO and your relationship um, to that that entire sort of narrative that started. And of course, I, th I think you said you had been abducted. And so Lorraine and I had a couple of questions to ask you. Number one, how is the movie going? Because I want to let you get the plug in for your movie. Thanks. Uh, movie, uh, you know, movie is progressing. I just finished the book. It should be out uh, sometime within the next couple of weeks. I believe we finally got the edit. Should be out on Kindle. So I, what I did is I, I combined both the movie and the sequel into one book. So that'll actually be out as a companion. The movie's going well. I mean, you know, we live in a really weird uh, age for making movies. Um, you know, we're ready to go. We've been uh, been at this for about, you know, a couple of years. And, uh, you know, I, I keep getting all kinds of interest from various places uh, so all over the world. So, yeah. Tell us, what is your movie about? The movie is, it's, uh, I guess we'll describe it as a uh, epic UFO action adventure thriller. But really it's about, it's an era piece. It really starts in 1930. It's about pretty much all the people that have been involved, including my uncle, uh, that was involved in the early movement or contactee movement is what they call it. Now they call it UFO experiencer. And essentially, uh, it's at about a place called Giant Rock, which is out in the middle of the Mojave Desert. And it actually is a giant rock. Uh, my uncle and, and his predecessor that was out there before, they actually lived inside of this rock that was about a nine, oh, nine story, bowl, eight and a half story boulder. And they carved out and lived out there, and next it was a dry lake, and it was a hotbed for UFOs, and still is. So let me ask you, um, uh, you I heard that you were abducted. You had said you were abducted somewhere along the way. Yeah, actually, when I was four years old out there, um, we had, you know, I actually lived out there, and it's had, you know, I've had multiple sightings, I think all, all together, somewhere around 27 from, uh, from uh, one as of, early, as of about three days ago. So, I mean, I, I look at them. My abduction occurred when I was four years old, um, and we, the grays, the ugly looking, uh, ant looking, uh, you know, aliens, uh, where I apparently, uh, I used to think that I was this uh, very, very special human being, but uh, there's been so much research out, and, and the estimate is just incredibly shattering, the amount of people that are actually abducted on an annualized basis. I mean, it's in the millions. So let me, let me ask you, what, what is an abduction like? Do you remember it from when you were four it, years old? I do. Uh, yeah, in fact, you know, it's funny. Whenever I talk about it, I, I get the same symptoms. I, my temperature starts going up. I actually start getting a fever, and, and it's, it's something kind of goes off in me. So, so I actually go back to that exact time. So every time I talk about it, I, I just get placed right back in there. And, and really what had happened is I was in a room with my two other brothers who were uh, you know, stone cold asleep. I was teleported through a window out to a ship. I was placed on a very metallic, sterile environment 
uh, on a table. Um, I had several people probing various instruments inside of me every which way. Uh, one that was particularly uncomfortable went down my spine. Was it cold, what these instruments? Did you feel them? Uh, yeah, I did. I fe I, yeah, I felt them. Um, and they were at the same time telepathically telling me that everything's going to be okay, that this wouldn't be, uh, that I wouldn't feel any pain, et cetera, et cetera, which was nonsense because I actually was feeling pain. I was in, it was in a state of terror. And so it was never, it was never, a, you know, people, uh, I guess, equated to an ET experience or something like that, a Spielberg. Uh, uh, you know, ET movie where you're touching fingers. Uh, I didn't get those. Hey, Lorraine, you have any <laughs> questions for Chad? Because it's super interesting this part. And you guys can change the video, by the way. Yes, I do have an, uh, uh, a question. Um, when you were living in that rock, um, is that when you were teleported through the window? And how did they actually make the window in the rock and the entryway into the rock to get in? And was it comfortable living there? Well, I actually, I just played there. Um, I lived at my grandmother's house, which was very close by. Um, so I didn't actually live there. I mean, I took naps down there, but it was, the inside of the rock was huge. It had a door. It was completely ventilated. It was uh, very, very comfortable in the winter. Uh, it, there was a piano down there. There were beds, couches. Uh, my uncle used to hold these uh, meetings, regular meetings, and he would channel UFOs. Uh, on, on a regular basis with, you know, up to about eight to ten people inside of this carved out rock. But it was actually done in 1930. It was blasted out by a man named Frank Kreitzer who lived there, out there for around 11 years. Let me ask you, did you check out any of the videos that we sent you about these UFOs over Brooklyn? Because that's, you know, sort of like, you know, I noticed that there aren't any videos of UFOs over Manhattan, so I guess uh, we're kind of special. This show broadcasts in Manhattan, but there are numerous sightings in Brooklyn. Do you, um, when you see these videos, do you, can you tell by looking at them whether they're, you know, doctored, kind of pretend or real? Have you, seen, you must have seen lots of them, so do you make I have. judgments? The, the one with the, that looked like, uh, you know, a cotton candy with all the colors, I've seen one identical to that one. So that one I've seen. And the other one was a metallic, very, very small, spherical thing. I've seen ones like that. But I, do, I have no way of telling the authenticity based on film because, uh, you, know, the, you know, the U.S. Army has had this holographic technology since, uh, oh, I guess, uh, um, um, right before the year 2000, that they can actually put whatever image they want out there so so I really don't know I, I can't verify by looking at a picture uh, or, or a film but the only thing I can say is two of those look very close to the ones that I've seen other places okay wow super interesting Lorraine any more questions here yeah I think, I think artists have been using those holograms for many many decades so it's not a new um, new science at all no it's not so yeah, so I, I, I caution anybody, you know, as far as, you know, when you see a film or what, and, and, and technology has come up to such a degree, uh, <laughs> I mean, I don't know, I mean, you go, go to a movie, I mean, you're almost implanted in this, uh, you know, 4D world. So, you know, as far as that. So. so let's take it a bigger picture now. So if there's UFOs and you've been abducted, that means we're not alone in the universe, right? Absolutely not. So I'd like to understand, what is your view of God and religion and stuff like that? Because, you know, you know, so much religion causes so many issues around the world and people go crazy in the Middle East in particular right now, all the jihadists and this, that and the other. What is your view having been, having more being in touch that we're not alone than other, nor you know, people, normal people? Right. You know, th this is one of the big issues. And this actually came back from, with Churchill uh, because, you know, during that time period during World War II, they had a tremendous amount of sightings over in England. And so he was talking to uh, FDR about it, and he was really concerned. And his comment was, if this gets out, and they wanted to suppress the information, this is the reason why uh, the continual suppression, you know, of the whole UFO movement. He says, Churchill said he feared that no one would, uh, no one would want to go to work pay taxes or go to church so uh, in, that in combination with some of you know my avocations compared to religion I mean you can just go to the Catholic you know encyclopedia I mean they have a wealth of information about this it, it's well known and and really what 
what religion is is a way is just another form of mind control trying to control the you know the population into uh, into a certain amount of submission I, I think if everyone really knew and were, were accessing uh, at least more or less the common man I think their whole view would, would change dramatically so um I guess you, you, you have different priorities than other people, like politics doesn't probably list very high in your world, I imagine, politicians having that. Oh, like, uh, like Donald Trump? No, yeah. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. no I just laugh at it. <laughs> you know, it's all a big comedy, and really it's like a tennis match going back and forth, Republican, Democrats, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Um, going back and forth, where essentially then there was, you know, you've got these, you know, I would call them little gremlins, you know, while you're sitting in the stands, they're picking your pockets, or at least your soul or your mind, while you're looking at this tennis match and going back and forth, you're basically distracted from the reality. So I, I have no political affiliation um, whatsoever. I mean, I, in fact, I think it's, if you thought about anybody looking at planet Earth, as far as borders right now, I'm down, I, you know, I, I have a place down in Mexico, I also have a place in California. I don't deem people vis-a-vis uh, -vis either, you, you know, I, you're part, we're all part of the human race, whereas the divisiveness that I hear and see from a lot of politicians, everyone is hell-bent on dividing us. Yeah. And, and, and we're so, one people. So, yeah. So, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right, sir. And, you know, um, I, I guess, you know, your view counts um, more than most of us because you have this kind of not really altered but different perspective. It really is the 40,000 foot view, you know, that Lorraine also has uh, on our topics, but you have it in, in, in real life. Where do you think this is going? Do you think the UFOs are going to eventually, I mean, they come and they look at us, I guess, and they, they say we're too screwed up to deal with and they travel on and they don't want to waste their time? Or do you think one day they're going to like scoop us up, put us in the basket or throw us in the garbage can? Yeah, the, 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 the prime, you know, there's, there's a big controversy with the whole, you know, and I try, and, and incidentally, there's politics within the whole UFO community, which I frankly, I, I don't participate I don't you know I don't belong to UFO Congress I don't go out there and try to you know do that stuff what I do is something a little bit more subtle which is actually provides some intelligent uh, uh, art or or uh, based on true events to get people to look at uh, things a little differently than try to sell somebody on this but there is a rivalry within this and there's a whole group that says oh yeah they're out to get us I heard this from Stephen Hawking and from other people that that you know uh, the, the they have the technology they've been here for thousands of years anyways they're actually walking amongst us and so they're already here but they have no intent on trying to take us over um, it, and they have the technology to, you know, I, I guess, to blast us out into oblivion. Um, you know, there's this whole whole philosophy about, you know, worried about, uh, you know, and of course, uh, like we're being like the Native Americans, uh, where we'd be taken over by the Europeans or something like that. That's just not, it just doesn't fit. Uh, and it makes no sense because, again, they're floating around in uh, free energy vehicles. Uh, you know, essentially, they're essentially time machines, interdimensional, extra, you know, extraterrestrial, and as far as worrying about them, I think they have a genuine concern because I think that they're, I think planet Earth is, uh, have been the origins of a lot of civilizations, and I think there's a certain kinship to this beautiful planet that we were intent on screwing up environmentally, uh, by nuclear, by all kinds of stuff. Um, so I think there's legitimate interest, and in, 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 uh, interesting enough, whenever there's any there's an explosion of UFO activity, right after uh, uh, you know uh, above ground nuclear, there was a swarm of stuff going on, or or wars. There seems to be a lot of, uh, I guess, friendly UFO people from all over that come here and try to uh, mitigate some of the the stuff that's going on. Um, and we've seen cases where they literally disarmed nuclear weapons. Okay. So I. I think that I think that we um, I think for the most part our friends I I don't know all of them I, the, supposedly there's I mean with all of the various planets out there supposedly there's uh, possibly 35 million different civilizations out there so I I I, I don't know all of them but I assume they're good. Okay, so Chad, hold on a second. Uh, Ryan, we got like a phone line open there. Ryan. It's the uh, Lorraine. Hey, Lorraine. Ryan, there's a, like a phone line there that's live. Anyway, I don't know what you want me to do. Uh, oh, uh, yeah, I guess Lorraine, you dial back in. Lorraine? Yeah.
Oh, Lorraine. Lorraine will dial back in. All right, sorry okay. about that, Ryan. It was just like it was like a second line, I guess. Yeah, I didn't know if you wanted to. Yeah, yeah, that's cool to dump her. It's cool. She'll call right back. All right, so Chad, um, I guess people are going to see your, go, go to your site, giantrockthemovie.com, and they can check it out a little bit more and uh, learn a little bit more about that. And um, I'll see if Lorraine calls back in. It's a very interesting interview. Oh, here, I'm here. I have uh, a question. Yeah, you have a question. Go ahead, Lorraine. Yes, I wanted to know if you noticed any, any difference in the way your brain um, um, changed from being um, experimented on. Uh, when you were abducted. Yes. yes, yes, definitely. I mean, um, you know, it, it's amazing. Uh, like, there's a huge difference between I have uh, uh, six brothers and sisters, and it's literally like I'm, you know, truly the alien within the family. I have, I have a complete different uh, mindset. And um, yeah, uh, I th and I, my view, like, as far as uh, uh, my psychic abilities and things like that, I, I think it had to do with something re injuring my pineal gland. Where it you know stayed open longer, and I think just the experience kept it open longer. And I think that what happens with most people, uh, you know, uh, is that they learn how not to see, learn how not to look. And I, th in other times in our you know, very civilization going back, it was encouraged, you know, and, and uh, you know to in fact look look at these various uh, I guess uh, uh, events and phenomena. And um, so I just went down this trail, not willingly, mind you. Um, I, I, I really didn't like sharing this information. Um, I, you know, I've had careers running energy companies, mining companies, I've done investment banking. This is not something that I've, you know, jumped up and down, uh, and, you, know, Christy, saying, yeah. you know, saying, hey, this. But yeah. what I'm interested Trump, yeah. in is, uh, it, you know, I, I, I just have a habit of, of, of being able to see. Okay, so we're going to let you go, Chad. We want to thank you very much because we're going to move on to the weather dude and get people to call in on some other stuff okay. so they can. But I want to thank you very much. I want to encourage people to check out your site. And uh, I really enjoyed talking to you, Chad. I hope we can do it again in the future because you're very interesting. Hey, it's been my pleasure, yeah, Tony. Yeah. I'd love, love to come back and talk again sometime. Okay. Lorraine, any last question? No, it was wonderful. All thank right. You. Thanks so much, Chad. Appreciate oh, okay. it. Okay. Bye-bye. Well, hey, we've got someone there on, on hey. the Skype. Hi. Who is that? This is uh, Christina Hansen, uh, live from Clinton Park Stables on West 52nd Street. Well, how are you? So, do you own a do you own a, a horse-drawn carriage? Uh, I don't own one. I'm a driver. Uh, I work for, for a couple of different drivers on their days off. So. Got it. So you're at a stable now. Yes, I am on the second floor of Clinton Park Stables on West 52nd Street. So tell me, are the horses well treated there? Can you show us a little bit if you're very steady with your phone, I guess? You've got us there? Uh, uh, so, um, look, I grew up in Lexington, Kentucky. I know about horses, and I wouldn't do this if these horses weren't well treated. Um, and as a matter of fact, we wouldn't be in business if our horses weren't well treated. They would have closed us down a long time ago. But we actually take excellent care of the horses here. And I'll see what I can show you here. This is. Um, but aren't you saying that because you make one money of our off of the horses? <laughs> Excuse me? But aren't you saying that because you make money off of the horses? Well, you know, do people, um, you know, veterinarians make money off of horses, too, you know? Why is making money such a bad thing. By making money using the horses actually means that the horses' bills get paid first. You know, it well, costs a lot of the horses are supposed to be wild. They're not supposed to be saddled up to a carriage with fat people rolling around in some dirty streets with smog. Well, first of all, horses are not wild animals any more than dogs or cats or cows or chickens are wild animals. They're domesticated animals. We have been working in partnership with horses for 6,000 years, civilization as we know it exists because of the horse. And, um, you know, that's like saying that we shouldn't have dogs or cats or cows or anything. They're not wild animals. They belong where people are. Uh, well, but you don't have they, cows strapped up with harnesses or dogs. Well, actually, you're wrong because there's a thing called an oxen. Uh, the oxen are cows that are actually used <laughs> strap things, and they were domesticated. Water buffalo were domesticated before horses, actually. And uh, I do believe Balto over in Central Park, there's a statue of him. Sled dogs. Let me ask a question here, Christina. 
Um, yeah. The, you know, I'm, I'm trying to understand what the issue is because the solution that de Blasio has offered of this electric car is just so uh, uh, so ludicrous. I mean, it, it doesn't make any sense at all uh, to give you a car or make you pay for one and in exchange we take the horse away. I mean, it just seems so fabricated. And, you know, I actually understand that, um, you know, regardless of whether it's cruel or not cruel, it, the, the, the issue doesn't seem to be that because, I mean, you know, I've seen a horse struggle and fall down in the street and they have to tranquilize it and all that kind of stuff, but that's, that's a normal occurrence. The horses that I have seen in Central Park have, have, have seemed to be rather, um, you know, well adjusted in the minimum, but I understand that, that, um, that activists who want to end the horse trade carriage, uh, horse, the horse carriage trade, contributed more than $1.3 million to Mr. de Blasio's campaign. And I'm wondering why they did that. Is it something, is it about the real estate? Is it about your stables at 50, at where, wherever you said you were? Is it very valuable where you are? Well, there's very valuable real estate on the far west side here. And what you have is this, this unholy combination between radical animal rights and real estate. It's a little bit of both, to, to answer your question. Uh, the stables here on 52nd Street are in very valuable property, uh, but the real problem is with the stables on 37th and 38th Street, half a block from the Javits Center and three blocks from the Hudson Yards development. They're actually in the Hudson Yards master plan area. They're in the way of, you know, potentially putting a 60-story, you know, luxury high-rise condominium there right by the railroad tracks, which will eventually be a boulevard. And so there is a lot of real estate interest there. And the real estate people also, there are a few of them that happen to be into radical animal rights, which is what we saw with the first commenter, which is the belief that animals shouldn't be domesticated at all. And total animal liberation, veganism, etc. So you have this weird combination, and they spent a lot of money to get Bill de Blasio elected by destroying Christine Quinn's campaign, by um, oh, you know, that's right. yeah, mobilizing mobilizing their voters who the animal people <laughs> no the real estate people use the animal people the animal people are single issue voters and mobilizing them to get out the vote and vote for Bill De Blasio and that's what that money was used for. Let out. me ask you who 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 is there in the stable with you? That is that it's, a horse? Here, this is Simba. Hey, He's Simba. one of the horses here. I've actually got about 70, 75 horses in the stable right now. Pretty much everybody's in tonight because uh, it's raining, so we're not out working. Got it. Um, yeah, there's 78 horses that live here on 52nd Street. Okay. Well, listen, uh, Christine. We're we're gonna, Christina. We're gonna let you go. We really thank you for this 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 time with us and giving us this real live cam view inside of a stable. We really appreciate it and hearing your side of the story. Yeah, I mean, people are welcome to, you know, especially the city council are welcome to come and see what it is that we actually do, meet our horses, meet us. I mean, we're real people, and, um, you know, this is all about this is all about this guy here, Simba, and the other horses. We don't want to drive electric cars. You know, we want, we're horse people. We're horse lovers. Got it. Well, thank you so much. We really appreciate the time, okay? All right. Thank you very much. Take care.